Kwame Johnson, President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters Atlanta. I'm so excited to be sitting down with you today. I got to hear a little bit about your story, but I'm so excited for you to share your transformation story with our Transformers so that they can be inspired by such an incredible person like yourself. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to jump straight into things. Let's do it. Alexa. All right. I appreciate you. Thank you. What is a specific moment that made you realize your potential to transform in such a significant way? Yeah, so, you know, I, through my life, I've had a lot of different transformations, but it makes me think back to growing up uh, in a place called Syracuse, New York, right? Uh, most people don't count Syracuse as part of New York, but I do. It's the true north. And, you know, growing up in a tough community with great parents, you know, I made a lot of bad decisions. And you wouldn't believe at the age of 17, I was facing well over 30 years in prison for my bad decisions in the, in the streets. And I ended up having to pay the ultimate price of going away to jail. And I went away for my whole senior year was a really challenging time for me. Everybody was going to prom, getting ready for different things. I'm locked up up north. Um, but I found my passion during that time and I also was transformed during that time. So I wouldn't change it for anything. And I met a lot of young men who look like me, who've empowered me to do the work that I've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, but I met Anthony, we were taught through the ventilation system. Uh, we met as enemies, we became friends through those conversations and helped each other get through that time. And Anthony said something to me that's put me on this journey of trying to help young people in particular, not make the same decisions I made. And he said to me one night, because I was asking him, I said, Anthony, man, why you keep coming back to Sour Chicken find me? And he said, Kwame, he said, man, your father comes to see you every week. I said, yes, he does. He said, my father's in the next unit, and I met him here for the first time. So that was Anthony's story. He was filled with rage. They would walk past each other and not even speak, right? But I knew if Anthony had mentors and people in his life like me, he would have a different outcome. And the night I was released from jail, Anthony, Shank, Tony, all these young men, I don't have enough time to tell you all their stories. They said a few things to me. They said, Kwame, Go as far as you can go, and they said, don't forget us. Fast forward six years ago, I joined Big Brothers and Big Sisters as the CEO. And of course, I got to get matched with a young person because we match adults with kids, match men with boys. Um, it's a big part of what we do is mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I get matched with a young person named what? Anthony, <laughs> right? And that's how God works, right? Yes, so yes. that's a, just a little sign to me that I'm doing the right thing and on the right track. But that transformation became from the Anthony's of the world, who typically you'll never hear their story. That's an incredible story. Mm -hmm. Such a strong why too, to be in a, in a prison where you're seeing men that look like us all over the place and wanting to break free, wanting to make a difference. And I think uh, them giving you that energy and fueling that transformation is really powerful. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing it at a CEO level for such a, a huge organization. That, that's a beautiful why. Can you share some of your most notable accomplishments in your career or personal life that you are particularly proud of? Yeah, you know, I would say my most notable, well, two things. One is I was the first kid to ever take the SATs behind bars in America. I made that record. And that's important to me, not just for me, but for other kids who come behind me who now can do that, because that was never a thing when I, was in, when I was coming through the process. The second would be, you know, just the work I do every day to help young people go to the next level. You know, you're an entrepreneur, respect what you've accomplished, man, hats off to you. Thank you. Let me say that first. And I consider myself a social entrepreneur. Mm. And what that means is my problems that I'm trying to solve are poverty. And in my opinion, poverty is the biggest issue we face in this country, bigger than racism. If you live in poverty, you got a really tough time. Yeah. And in Atlanta, where we are right now, if you're born in poverty, you got a 4% chance to make it out. Wow. So my laser focus, my whole entire 20 years lane has been to get people out of poverty. The fastest way out of poverty is a high school diploma, right? So it's not rocket science. We help kids stay in school, graduate high school, they got a chance. Right. So that's been my laser focus. It's a big problem that will probably always be here, but we should be able to solve it, never eliminate it, right? So my biggest accomplishment, for example, is last year when 98% of the kids I work with graduated high school. Oh, great. When 98% of them avoided the criminal justice system. So those results I see every year in the line of work that I do with mentorship, because yes. we know it works. None of us in this room got here without a mentor. So that's what I'm most proud about is when I see young people graduate high school because I know they got a shot to make it out of poverty. Wow. Well, I, I, so you can sign me up. I definitely would love to uh, mentor a few. I can, I, can, yeah. I can juggle a few names. Uh, what was it like preparing for the SATs in prison? Uh, like what, what was your source to prepare for that? Yeah, so that's a whole story, right? But I'll, I'll tell you, so... Um, when I, when I went to jail, before I went to jail, I was a track runner, right? I was a 400 guy. I was top 10 in the country. So when I got in trouble, all my scholarships went away. But my mentor, when I first mentor was my track coach. So when I went to jail, he would bring me my schoolwork every week so that I could still graduate on time. So the plan was for me to graduate with my class, which no one thought would happen, 
and the plan was me to go to college on a, on a track scholarship still. But I had to do my schoolwork behind bars in the mail. I had to I had to take my SATs, which is kind of hard when you locked up, right? Mm-hmm. And my track coach is a white guy, Maynard, hard to go, right? And I think that's important to mention because we need to bring more folks together. He didn't run from me, he ran toward me, he came mm-hmm. to me. He wasn't, he didn't fear me, he helped me. He brought me my schoolwork every week. I did it in jail, through the mail. So the last step was to take my SATs. So where I was at in James Wolf Correctional Facility in upstate New York, within your two months of being released, you can get approved for what's a furlough. A furlough is where you can go home for 24 hours. So furloughs are used for go to a funeral. Sometimes they're used to go to work when you're in prison. So my plan was to apply for my furlough and go take my SATs and come back. Everyone I knew had got their furlough approved. They would go home for 24 hours, get high, drunk, have a good time, come back and sleep for the next two months and then go home. So I went to the parole board, essentially what it was, to you know, make my case for my furlough. Doing my schoolwork, working in the kitchen, mentoring people. I'm a model inmate, right? I'm trying to get my life back. So I applied for the furlough. What do you think they say? They denied you. They denied it. That's insane. Because I, they said I was a threat to society. So that wasn't going to be the title of my book, Threat Society. But my publisher was like, nah, it's a little too hard. Let's go with the hope inside a little bit more <laughs> soft. But um, so I'm disappointed. I go back to my cell. I'm reading the SAT commission book. Um, and there's a section in there for students who have disabilities. So if you're disabled, the SAT will administer the test on site. Oh, wow. So I wrote them a letter. Mm-hmm. I said, I can't make it to a test site. I didn't say much details. <laughs> I said, this is where I'm at. Yeah. And they approved it. Yeah. So the day of my test comes, they do a shakedown on my unit. They've never done that before. So they come in, they're looking for contraband. I got textbooks and all this. I'm like the nerd of the jail. And they come in and they come out and they say, this, is this cigarette yours? Because they know if I have a cigarette or contraband, I got to go back to the hole for 10 days. Mm-hmm. Right? And I can't take my SATs. This is how hard they tried to prevent me yeah. from getting my life back in order. Wow. But Shank, who was my enemy when I first met him, had a really tough life, came next door, and took the blame for that cigarette and went to the hole for 10 days for me. Wow. And I took my SATs and became the first kid ever to do that in the United States of America. Now, one thing you said that really uh, resonated with me is that uh, poverty is, is worse than racism. Yeah. And you don't realize until you become successful how racism kind of goes away when, when they want you to sign checks. So <laughs> you pull up a certain way, yeah. you know, doors are opening for you as sir, welcome. Yes. But when you're poor, you're being <laughs> followed around, you know, accused of everything. So that, that was a really powerful statement. I could, I could attest to that because I grew up really poor as well. Yeah. And uh, now that I'm an entrepreneur and I have a level of success, I've just noticed such a better treatment from society. Yeah. You know? Yeah, racism is still there, right? It's going to yeah. always be there. Correct. And I don't know how to solve that, right? Yeah. It's probably need to be solved by somebody who don't look like me and you. But poverty we can solve. And when you're not in poverty, you got a better chance to navigate racism. What were some of the biggest hardships that you faced since starting Big Brothers, Big Sisters? And how did you overcome them? Yeah, well, what I'll first say is that, you know, you, you may not hear about a black CEO of a nonprofit. Most people not, may not even know who's watching this podcast with a nonprofit is. And what I will say is there are tons of organizations out there, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, your local church, your local university. These are all nonprofits trying to help people get to the next, next level. And, you know, so to become a CEO of a nonprofit with my background was hard to do that, right? And I had a lot of mentors who helped me get there along the way. But at Big Brothers and Big Sisters, we had to navigate COVID, right, which was really tough. We had matches that closed because folks couldn't get together. It was just a really challenging time. But one of the biggest things we did to push through that was move our headquarters to Southwest Atlanta, which is not too far from here, from Midtown, to be more in the community, to really help make more matches, right? During COVID, I was getting calls from principals every day saying, I need a mentor for every kid in my school building. Right now, a kid, all kids go to school, right? Regardless of your situation, you're poor, you got, you, uh, you got a juvenile justice issue, you're homeless, all kids go to school, right? So my focus has always been how do we help kids stay in school and support them there? So when I got these principals telling me I need a mentor for every kid in my building, that could be 600, that could be 1,000 kids. Wow. And I could pitch this all day long. I'd probably get about five brothers in this room to sign up, but that's not 600. Right. So I came up with a new solution to solve that problem called a program called Level Up, where I'm hiring and embedding mentors in school buildings. Mm. So I'm hiring brothers and sisters from the community. Many of them went to these same schools. Many of them have lived experiences like me and you. And just imagine going through high school or middle school, you had someone you can go talk to. I wish I did. Yeah. Maybe I wouldn't have made the decisions I made. So that was a key problem that we came up with a new solution. And now I have that program across seven schools in Atlanta 
And just imagine what that could look like across the country if every kid in middle school and high school had a mentor in their life. Kids get academics when they go to school, they get a guidance counselor. But in this day and age with social media, with mental health, all the challenges young people are facing, the need for mentorship is more essential now than ever. So that's my big, big plan yeah. is to infuse mentorship in public education in America. Mentorship is so powerful. To your point, I wouldn't be here without mine. So uh, to be able to give back, it, it, it would be a full circle moment. Mm -hmm. Were there any role models who played a significant role in your journey and how did they influence you? Yeah, one I'll mention for sure is Robert L. Woodson. And I encourage everybody to look him up. It goes by Bob Woodson. He is a civil rights leader, uh, a, actually a conservative civil rights leader. So if you think of a, a, a conservative Jesse Jackson, that's Bob Woodson. And he was part of the civil rights movement. He left the civil rights movement because he thought it benefited middle class blacks and not poor blacks. And that's an interesting conversation to have, right? Because you go south side, west side of Atlanta, there are a lot of folks who got left behind in the civil rights movement. But Bob started a nonprofit doing gang work all around the country. And I met him when I got to Hampton University. So I got out of jail. Hampton gave me a shot on a partial track scholarship. And I'm there. I'm feeling like a fish out of water. I got like Timberland, every color Timberland boots, white T-shirts. <laughs> and I'm around nothing but bougie black folks at Hampton <laughs> University. Right? I feel out of place. Yeah. I just I came home. And I'm like trying to simulate into this new environment, which was good for me. But it was just very different than how I grew up. But I meet this guy named Bob Woodson. And he, you know, here's my story. I tell him about what I was doing. He tells me he's doing all this work with gangs around the country. And uh, he's like, hey, come work for me. So I left Hampton when I was 19. And I had to call my parents and tell them, like, listen, mm -hmm. I just got here, but I'm about to go up to D.C. Yeah. and work for this guy named Bob and follow my passion and try to find the Anthony's of the world. So I went up to D.C. and worked for Bob for seven years. He took me around the country, met, took me to the White House. You know, he got me comfortable with my story, which a lot of black folks, black men in particular, we ain't comfortable with our story. Yeah. You know, we, we know, you know, a lot of folks got my story, but they're not going to tell it. They're not comfortable with it. He helped me get very comfortable with it. He helped me use it as a tool, as a, as a lane for myself. So Bob Woodson was my first professional mentor, a mentor of mine, um, modeled for me how to be a CEO, modeled for me to be how to be comfortable yes. as a CEO, modeled for me how to communicate and talk with people and give speeches and be on stages. Yeah. So I give him his props. He's still doing the work. And his big thing was going into communities and finding what he, what he called human antibodies. Yeah. Folks yeah. already in these communities doing work. Yes. Too often they get overlooked, right? Yeah. You hear about Big Brothers and Big Sisters because we got a big brand, a big name. Mm -hmm. But there are tons of small nonprofits all around the city doing work. So he would go in and find those groups and help build them up. Mm -hmm. So he showed me how to do that work. And I've been trying to implement those principles since I left Bob's, you know, about 10 years ago. I, he must be so proud of you and yeah. seeing how you flourished and, you know, what he awarded. Grew, grew and started producing. Yeah. How do you continue to integrate the lessons learned from your transformative story into your daily life? You know, being in solitary confinement is a very extreme situation, right? You never forget that. It just, it's implanted. It's like a brand on your body, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like God put me through that situation so I would never forget it, mm -hmm. so that I would always continue to wake up thinking about how I can help the Anthony's and Shanks of the world. I was given a second chance. Like I, I was given a second chance. I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here, right? Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why I shouldn't even be in the seat right now. So I got to stay true to that focus and trying to help young people. And that's what I think about every day is how can I use my influence to continue to get the word out to help more young people see that they can do it too and have that hope inside. What advice would you give to an aspiring transformer who are just starting out on their own transformation journey? Yeah, so there's two things like I tell young people all the time, right? And it's one, you got to find your passion <clears throat> and you got to figure out what you're good at. Anybody you look up to, you know, I'm sure you figured it out. Anybody, anybody who's accomplished anything significant in life have figured out those two things. And not only have they figured it out, they've figured out how to marry them together and monetize them in many ways, right? Yes. So, you know, I'm really big on passion. You know, I'm not really big on you, you can do whatever you want to be, whoever you want to be. You know, I don't really believe that, right? Because, you know, that translates to being a basketball player, a football player, or a rapper in, in our communities. Yeah. And that may work out for some, but if that ain't your passion and it ain't your gift that God gave you, chances yes. are ain't gonna work out, right? right. It's, not, it's no problem to make that a hobby or something you like to do for fun. So I always preach to young people and young leaders, you gotta figure out what your passion is. I meet so many adults, so many folks who've worked many years who've never figured out their passion and never really figured out what they're good at. And you really got to figure that out. For me, my passion, I found it through Anthony. I got lucky. I found it at 17. Yeah. 
I'm the type of person, I'm good in the streets and also in the suites. Yeah, yeah. So I've taken those two things, my passion and my ability to navigate situations and, and circumstances, and I married them together and I've created a lane for myself. Mm -hmm. So that's what I encourage young leaders is to figure out those two things. And your passion, what I tell you, it is already in you. And you probably believe this too. You tell me you, how you would like just you know, envision you getting to this point and you would like yes. think about it. it was in your subconscious mind already. Yes, yes. So your passion is already there. Yes. So a lot of times it's hard for people to figure out how to pull that out. But all I can tell you is it's already there. God already gave it to you and already gave you your gifts too. So if you figure out what you're good at and your passion, your gifts, yeah. you'll win. You hit a lot of uh, key things, uh, gems today that I had to learn over time to get to this point, which is honing in on my passion, finding my why, what's going to fire me up. And, and, and also mentorship and taking uh, adversity and, and helping, letting that help build your leadership skills and, and, and your passion. Yeah. So uh, it was an honor to sit with you today and hear all of these gems. I definitely can't wait to work with you. I would love to mentor uh, some of the boys and I can take a few of them. You know, I think it, it's, it actually keeps me going too, to remind myself, you know, why I got here and, and how I got here. And uh, so I look forward to that moment with you. I'm sure this isn't the last time that I'll see you. Yes. And uh, I look forward to reading your book in its entire, entirety. Thank Appreciate you so you. much for being here at the Transformation Factory for our Transformers series. And I hope to see you soon and, you know, get to work. Appreciate you, brother. You yes, keep yes. doing what you're doing too, man. Yes. Proud of you, for Thank sure. Thank you so much.